right. Hey everybody. So in our last video, we looked a lot at the first fundamental form and how we could use it to uh, compute some intrinsic geometric uh, quantities, right? Things like length within our surface uh, or area of our surface or area of some subset of our surface. Uh, and we use the first fundamental form to achieve this. Now today, I want to start looking outside our surface and specifically looking at where our surface sits in space. And to do that, we are really going to be interested in not just our surface itself, but also the perpendicular or normal direction of our surface at any given point. And so to set the stage, we have to introduce this uh, very important map or this very important function, which we call the Gauss map. Uh, so first, a little bit of setup. Uh, we're going to be looking at a regular surface in R3. So here's a picture of a surface S. Uh, and we note that as long as our surface is regular, at every single point, P, on our surface, we have a well-defined tangent space, right? A well-defined T uh, sub P of S. So we have a well-defined tangent space that is a two-dimensional space. And that also means, because we're sitting inside of R3, right, that there is a one-dimensional subspace that's perpendicular to the tangent plane and therefore perpendicular to the surface, right? And we call that direction the normal direction. Right? So for example, if I were to, uh, that's great, if I were to take this as my point P, right, then it's likely uh, that I could create my tangent plane, TPS, that would be a two-dimensional space, and then there's going to be one di direction, right, or one dimension that is completely perpendicular to or completely normal to my surface at that point. Now what that means is that if there's a sur uh, uh, direction, right, that's perpendicular to our surface, right, there are actually going to be two choices of unit normal vector, right? So if this is a perpendicular direction or a normal direction, I can think of the unit normal vector, that's the vector of length one, that's perpendicular to my surface and perpendicular to my tangent plane. And I have two choices. I either have the vector that's of one unit pointing, you know, for lack of a better word, directly up, or of a vector of one unit that's pointing directly down, right? And so with that one dimensional direction that's perpendicular to my surface at that point, I really have these two uh, choices, or this choice of two different directions, either quote unquote up or quote unquote down. And of course, this is going to change at every single point on my surface. So for example, if I move to a different point, and let's say maybe I move to, to this point right here, right? then all of a sudden my tangent space is different. Right? Maybe this one is sort of more in this direction. Uh, and my unit normal vector would point in a different direction as well. So at this point Q, uh, I would get this direction right here, right? a different unit normal direction. But at each point on my surface, I could find such a tangent space and I could find such a perpendicular direction. Now, if our surface is orientable, then I can choose a nice consistent direction right, for my unit normal vector. And all I mean by that is that as I move around my surface, all of my unit normal vectors should be pointing uh, quote unquote up or quote unquote out of the surface or what have you, but all pointing in a similar and consistent direction, right? I don't want to have a situation in which uh, at one point over here, my, surf my vector is pointing out of the surface and at another moment in time, so a little bit further away, my vector is pointing down into the surface. Um, but if my surface is nice and orientable, this shouldn't be a problem, right? I should be able to find a nice consistent choice of direction for my unit normal vector. Now, this observation is going to allow us to define this thing called the Gauss map by the following uh, sort of uh, correspondence. Right. So we're going to make the observation that unit normal vectors always have length one and so, by this correspondence, this equivalence between points and vectors, I can think of vectors that have length 1 as being points, and those are points that just sit unit 1 away from the origin. In other words, unit vectors in three-dimensional space can be associated with the unit sphere 
in three-dimensional space, right? So the sphere of radius one, right? And I can do that as follows for my first vector, right? This was like this vector here that's pointing straight up. I could associate that vector with, say, the North Pole, right? The idea being that that vector corresponds to this vector that's pointing from the origin due north uh, or due up. And by the equivalence of points and vectors, rather than drawing this whole vector, I can just think about that point. So there's my point associated with that unit normal vector. If I were to look at my point Q, right, my point Q has a unit normal vector pointing in that direction. And so that would correspond to a different point on the unit sphere, perhaps this point up here. Right? And so we can see how every single point on my surface S can have a unit tangent vector, which is then associated with a point over here on my unit sphere. And that's going to motivate the following definition. Right? So if we have a regular orientable surface S, right? so everything that we've just been saying continues to hold true, we can define a continuous function, which I will call lowercase n, a continuous function from my surface to the unit sphere. And it will essentially send points over here, right? so that I can send a point P, and that's just going to be a point on my surface S, to the corresponding point that's associated with the normal vector of P. Right? And so we can sort of see this as follows. If P is a point over here, Right? So maybe this is my, my P for the day. Uh, if this is a point P, then I can find the corresponding unit normal vector. And then over here, the point I get on the sphere, that is going to be N of P. Right? And I can do this for every single point. So if I choose a different point with a different color, right? let's say I choose a point here that's just in a similar spot but a little bit further up the surface, I'll get a slightly different, oh, let's choose. Let's choose, let's draw that a little better. If I got a point here, I can have a slightly different vector, right? Still a unit vector, but maybe the angle is slightly different, the direction is slightly different, and so I get a different corresponding point over here, right? And similarly, I can plot each of these points to their corresponding point on the sphere. Now, this function, right, this little n of p, or this little n, is going to be called the Gauss map or sometimes we'll simply call it the defined orientation on our surface, right? And if a surface has a well-defined Gauss map, we'll call that surface orientable. Surfaces that might not have a well-defined Gauss map might be surfaces such as a Mobius strip, right? Or other surfaces in which as you move around the strip, you change, or as you move around the surface, you change your orientation. All right, worth saying out loud that the Gauss map is a map from one surface to another surface, right? It's from the surface, capital S, to the unit sphere, which we're writing as script S, uh, upper, uh, uh, script S2. So it turns out to not depend specifically on a given parameterization, right? There was no parameterization in our previous picture. But if we do define a parameterization, so if we have a capital X that maps uh, you know, some uh, subset of R2 onto S, right, and this becomes a coordinate patch, then I have the associated composition, capital N, which is given as little n of X. So this is the uh, map that takes a single point over here, Right, so it's going to take a point in our domain, going to map it to the corresponding point on the surface, and then from there it will calculate the unit vector and map it to the corresponding point over here on our unit sphere. So our capital, uh, capital N is the map that is the composition of those two maps, and it maps directly from my, uh, my domain U to my unit sphere S2. All right, so we have our lowercase n, that's our Gauss map, and the corresponding capital N for any given parameterization. It's worth saying out loud that just as x is a parameter, describes a parameterization of a parametrized surface, 
right? So does n describe a parameterization of a parameterized surface. It's specifically a parameterization of the unit sphere, right? Because it's sending a coordinate system into or onto this surface in three-dimensional space. It just so happens that the surface is the unit sphere, right? So n as itself gives us a way to realize our Gauss map or to understand our Gauss map by looking at the given parameterization. Okay, and now just a few final thoughts. Of course, we'll do more computation down the way, but it's worth saying, right, if we have a parameterization, if we have a capital uh, X, then we know already that X sub U is going to be tangent to the surface, X sub V is going to be tangent to the surface, and therefore X sub U cross X sub V is going to be normal to the surface. And so if that normal direction corresponds with our Gauss map, in other words, if I take X sub U cross X sub V, giving me a normal vector, and then if I divide by the length, giving me a normal unit vector, I'm sorry, a unit normal vector, then we would say our Gauss map is consistent with the parameterization if our capital N is actually equal to that computation we just did, right? Otherwise, we have the situation where we're looking at the quote-unquote wrong unit normal, right? Where our Gauss map gives us a unit normal vector pointing this way, while our x sub u cross x sub v gives us a unit normal pointing that way. And in that case, we would just say that it is not consistent. So if our, uh, uh, if our Gauss map is not consistent with the parameterization, then we would just get that our n would equal negative x u cross x v over the length of x u cross x v. Right? So our uh, parameterization can either be consistent with the Gauss map or not, and it just depends up to this plus or minus factor. Uh, secondly, right, we said that n was itself a parameterized surface or a, a mapping, a parameterization of the unit sphere. Uh, so if our original parameterization x was nice and smooth, right, if it was of class ck, so we could take k derivatives of it uh, and have them all be continuous, then n as a parameterization is class c uh, k minus 1. In other words, if our x is nice and smooth, then our n parameterization will also be nice and smooth, just one degree less than x. Um, and that, in a certain sense, makes sense because right, our n was defined using, or it could be defined using, the derivatives of x and v. So we would have to take one more derivative to get to our definition of n. Uh, the final thing that I want to say in this video is that, in fact, our if we consider both the surface itself and the unit sphere as parameterized surfaces, and we consider their corresponding points, p, and what it gets mapped to, n of p, then the tangent spaces, tps and t sub np, of the unit sphere are actually parallel to each other, right? And I just want to point out this, this nice fact that if I have a surface and I create its tangent space, right, then the unit normal vector is perpendicular to that tangent direction, which means that that vector here will get mapped to this point up here, and then the corresponding tangent space over here, right, so this tangent space over here is exactly t sub n of p, of the surface S2, right? This is exactly going to be parallel to that tangent plane down there. So oftentimes, if we're working on some sort of tangent space here, we can think of it as being equivalent to the tangent space up here and vice versa. And at moments in the you know, coming weeks, we will take advantage of this parallelity and this equivalence so that we, if we're looking at some computation we want to do on some vector up here, we can just take the corresponding vector down there and work in that tangent space as well. So I'll try to identify that when we're doing it going forward.